Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. Mr. Fremer, we're just doing a tail end of the seminar on record restoration, and we just covered, uh, Michael, uh, for your edification, that yes, all cleaning systems do something, because they do make contact with the surface of a record. That's no doubt, whether it be a manual system, a vacuum system, even an ultrasonic, whether it's an ultrasonic that works or doesn't work, or it's a bubbler, doesn't matter, we're doing something. But we just explained here that water droplets are 100 microns, and the charge of the water droplet, with or without a soap in there, is the same charge as the record. So basically the record is letting the water flow. If you're manually cleaning it, vacuum cleaning it, uh, even sonically cleaning it, you're only doing the surface. You can't get into the record. So what, uh, uh, what, what we find is, yes, we've done something, but by air and vacuum drying, I, we've left a film. So now, with your cartridge and your needle, you're actually gouging that out. And we just showed a slide where the Shure brothers noticed with their V15 Mark IV back in 1977 was gouging something out. The dealers and audiophiles saying, there's something wrong here. And I did not know this 11 years ago. I found this document that I showed earlier two years ago. Yes, indeed. They, they had a problem. And so in 1978, you even go on the Shure archive site, they provided you with a brush with the cartridge. So you remove whatever the cartridge is gouging out, or the needle is gouging, I, I should say, so it doesn't get onto the cantilever and so on. And unfortunately, we have record resellers that will make records shiny. So forget about cleaning them. We have a guy in Denver that uses shoe polish with lighter fluid, coats the record, makes it look good. If he can't see scratches, he'll charge you $40. My good friend Bob Donnelly in LA, record guy, uh, in the business and as a private reseller, he told me to go and buy a record that's great for your audition. You can test sound systems. It's really exciting. So I went to the reseller in Denver. Uh, I, bought, I, saw, I saw two of them, same pressing, same catalog number, everything. One was at $40, the other one was at $4. And I saw the guy doing this cleaning. And I told him, what are you doing? Oh, it's shoe polish. I don't care. Well, long story short, uh, and we'll explore, uh, explain what we do. Anyways, long story short, I stripped all that down and all records were scratched. But I did not hear any of the scratches. I heard a couple of pops, needle drops, but I was able, both looked horrible. So it was dressed up for sale and we saw this at the Capitol Audio Show. Record resellers say, this is brand new, never been touched. With Bob Grossman, Philadelphia Harmonic, uh, retired. He was their custodian of records. Uh, he also was a bassoon player. He's now working with the Hirsch Museum that I introduced and bringing, resurrecting some old records. Uh, we saw brand new records scratched, or brand new records that were coded, sold as new. We restored them, and they were all scratched. You know, before I got thrown out, <laughs> uh, Gary, Gary uh, Gill, who's the organizer, said, "Charles, don't worry about it. You caught them, and I'm happy because you saved a lot of grief to the guys that came to see you." So, long story short. Uh, all these skewered systems and whatever don't work because of the fact that the standing waves, there's a loading factor in ultrasonics. An ultrasonic has to be measured with Mr. Fremer's $11,000 meter I had to buy for you and the $28,000 with the digital display Could you to prove. Before you go any further, can I stop you for one second? Yes. Could you explain, because a lot of readers don't understand, exactly what cavitation is? Very good. Okay. Is that all right with you folks for Mr. Fremer? Because we've covered this earlier. So I'm just going to go here to my Sorry. slide on cavitation. Start. There we go. So here's an ultrasonic tank, stainless steel, typically. And, uh, you know, they're rated 4 liters, 8 liters, 6 liters, which is 1.78 gallons, whatever. Underneath we have basically speakers or transducers. Now these transducers are audio, basically. They're coupled to the base of the stainless steel. And uh, the, nowadays they call them ceramic transducers. And they generate an ultrasonic signal, sound. 25 kilohertz, or 30 kilohertz, or 35 kilohertz, or 40, or 60, or 120, or 100,000. It all depends on what we're trying to clean or decontaminate. That's the key that we need to figure, irrespective of frequency. 
So in this, again, this isn't me, this is the industry standard, where we have, in our case, 35 kilohertz signal, where I'm like everybody else. I have high intensity, but very uneven. So picture your record in here. Ooh, well, that's not too good. Here I have relatively uniform, but high intensity. And here I have high intensity. So as I move up, I now have differencing or different types of affectations of whatever I'm cleaning. In my case, it's a record. So something that we talked about is the triboelectric table of charges. And I need to bring this in before we talk about ultrasonics further. If I put a record in my machine, if I put a record in any machine, I will have some contact with the water, with the surface of the record. I will do something. I will take some of the fungus off. I may see, uh, with or without a soap in here, I will remove some fingerprint oils, you know, some oils from, you know, McDonald's French fries and maybe some of the cocaine down here uh, in the past. But I can't get in the groove because the size of the groove is about 30, 35 microns. But a water droplet is 100 microns. That's science. That's not me. So I'm not doing anything. So here, negative charge, negative charge of the record. Uh, we're, not also, we're also repelling the water. And the triboelectric table of charge says PVC is negative, and water with or without a soap is negative. So we do have issue number one, which we're, we do have some repelling. Kind of jumping where we're at. Our process changes the charge of the record from positive to negative. So what does that do? Just like we saw in the previous slides, negative, uh, sorry, north pole and north pole of a magnet, they'll repel. South pole, south pole of a magnet, they'll repel. Negative and negative, positive and positive, they'll repel. Positive, negative, ah, negative, positive, we attract. So I need to do something to the material that I'm going to process in an ultrasonic. Uh, there we go, whoops. So here, this is the standard aluminum foil test that we were talking about with everybody, Mr. Fremer included, where when I worked on the space shuttle in 1978, our baths were six foot long, four foot wide, four foot tall, and twice a day we had aluminum foil on the frame go in to take a look at the dimpling. We need a dimpling because we had hundreds or 30, in our case, 38 or so transducers and twice a day we have to make sure for spacecraft that all transducers are working per NASA law or regulations to make sure that the spacecraft materials we worked on are cleaned. If we had a transducer that did not dimple the aluminum foil, we now have a problem and we'd have to redo that production of the day. So if we're now taking, and this was my uh, layman's test with, uh, with Mr. Fremer originally because he said, Charles, you're full of it. Prove me otherwise. And, and I enjoyed the task. So I made these aluminum foil records. The ones that I use with Mr. Fremer, you see here, balsa wood. I'm a model railroader, so I dug this up. Uh, I actually uh, wanted to make some aluminum foil records, not just a single one, but ones that go into these rotisserie style ultrasonics where you have 12 records that are all spaced together. So this is one of them here. And you can see where I have high intensity impacts, no, in, no impacts, and some moderate impacts. Why? There is no resonance. Remember, very high, uneven, high intensity, even, so-so in the middle. And the record is spinning, and the water is moving. So you're having all of these affectations. So, hmm. That may be not a good idea on aluminum foil. It certainly isn't good if I change the charge of the record to be opposite to that of the water. Now I'd be affecting that record seriously. What is the charge of aluminum foil? Uh, uh, well, it doesn't matter for the aluminum foil because it's of a low density or tensile strength that it will read the ultrasonic cavitation. Okay, okay. So we don't have to apply as foil. Okay. Very good point. Good student. Yeah, grasshopper. One more question. Yes. What is the implication of having the transducers on the side of the tank rather than on the bottom of the tank? Very good. Because there are machines that do that. Yeah. Ultrasonic science states that when we have transducers, we need to have the waves come up. Okay. If I now have opposing, 
And I, again, with the ones that do work, I have a signal here, or if I have a signal here, or if I have a signal here, or if I have a signal here, depending where I place the transducer, we do not have the full effect and intensity because they're not using a whole array of transducers on the bottom that allows the bubbles all to rise, to implode, to create that vacuum. It's and what happens also, we have standing wave reflections where on the side they're being pushed back because the record is repelling the water more but easily. Now you're getting to what cavitation is, finally. So it is the bubbles created by the transducer. The shock waves create bubbles. Yes. When the bubble bursts, yes. that it creates, creates a vacuum. OK, creates a vacuum. And that, and that, it does what? It, it then pulls whatever is on the surface that you're cleaning away from it. So it's, it is actually a form of vacuum cleaning. It is. It is. Now, in the aluminum foil test, you have the impacts because they're shock waves. That you have the reflection coming back. So that's the way that ultrasonics operate. And it doesn't, and, and again, to, to perhaps elaborate for you, Michael, is where here I've added resonance. Okay, I have a 35 kilohertz. First of all, why 35 kilohertz? Why not 120 kilohertz? Why not 25? Yes, what are the differences? What we need to take a look at is the material that we are trying to clean. Everyone forgets that. Oh, they say, well, 120 kilohertz, uh, the bubbles have higher intensity, they're more precise, and so on. But when you take a look at a record of 3.5 microns of dust, okay, I remember when we started, what's the size of fungus and dust? We all learn together, three to five. We just discussed earlier where if I go for a colonoscopy and I get now a camera that goes up here, I want some ultrasonic to be able to remove my DNA so that when this gentleman over here goes to my doctor and gets his colonoscopy after me, he doesn't get my DNA of his. Okay? So in the medical field, you see 120 kilohertz, uh, as a frequency of choice because we're looking at 0 0.05 microns of bacteria. This is 3 to 5 microns, okay? That's what we have as dirt and dust. I didn't invent it, that's science. You see 120 kilohertz used for silicon wafers, gold migration protection and manufacture of chips. That's not a record. Yes, it's good for detail. Of course, that's what I have. I've been medical instruments. There's a lot of crevices and whatever. You don't use 25 kilohertz on the opposite end because that's made for CNC machines where we have oil on, on, on metal parts and whatever that we want to clean or reduce. So the 35 kilohertz with a resonance. So what is this resonance? Look, this is our aluminum foil that you've seen me put in, even cavitation from the edge of the record to the dead wax area. This is proof in a 78 record, even cavitation uh, which already these folks already saw from the edge of the record to the dead wax area. And even cavitation in an ultrasonic, which is ours, where I can only put four records in a six liter tank. There's the law of surface area where ultrasonics have loading issues. I cannot overfill an, a six liter ultrasonic bath with more than X amount. And it goes by square inches that, of area that you need to cover. In a record, you can calculate this. Uh, radius multiplied by, uh, uh, multiplied by two. Anyway, so you calculate the surface area. And using a 35 kilohertz ultrasonic, I, have, I can only put four records inside of LP size. That's it. And they have to be spaced accordingly. Because if I now do these skewers, just like we have in this, uh, this one here, we have uneven cavitation, not just because there's no modulation or harmonic or resonance, it's because these guys are too close together and there's a standing wave. For those of you that are CB operators, radio operators, you know you have an antenna on your car's roof, you have the transmitter in your car, you have the coax that goes from the cable that goes from the output of the uh, radio to the antenna. And if you have a good match, it's 1 to 1, or 1.1 1 .1 to 1. No reflected signal. If you have something disturbing that antenna, bad connection, 3 to 1, 4 to 1. What do you do? That power now comes back. In the case of a CB transmitter, ham transmitter, it will kill the final. 
In this case, it kills the activity of ultrasonic. So our, we're not injecting in our machine a signal. This cover that holds our records, remember we talked about cavitation, the bubbles moving around? The bubbles do create air pressure. The cover is being made to bring a resonance downwards. So I'm evening the up these violent areas. That's why I have this even. If I did not have the cover on, I would now have ultrasonics of different, uh, different signals. There we go. Uh, so uh, what other questions did you have there, Michael? What, what are the implications of having the transducers on the sides as opposed to the bottom? Well, that's what we kind of covered where you, you need to, well, number one, first of all, where are they located? On the sides, they go up this way. They're going to be far away from the record. I need to have ultrasonic cavitation on the bottom. I didn't invent this. This is the rule. And also, what about these other systems? So why did they put it on the side? They didn't know what they were doing? Or no. It, 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 they it, thought it, it would be more direct because it was on the side? Yeah, I, I would assume that. But no one has used, a, in the industry, a cavitation meter. Or the other tester, which is LC, LED, that gives me the frequency and the power. So I ask everyone, you know, these, every manufacturer, we don't do this. Oh, I have 60 watts of cleaning power, 90 watts of cleaning power. Is that the safety certificate of the current draw of your machine, the motor and whatever? Or is it watts per square inch or cabins? No one has been able to answer that in any of the manufacturers for the last 14 years that I know of and still to this day. So if you're buying a machine, is it a real ultrasonic or is it a soap bubbler? So it's watts per square inch or square centimeter. And is it even? And in the slides that we've had here, which I'm going to have to locate since I did my usual job, you'll see that in some systems we have zero cavitation. So here, let me go here. Da, da, da. There. There. OK, and current slide. Get that out of here. Okay, so here's the evenness of our signal, there. So here's the skewer system. Again, this is the first test we did for you, balsa records, now I use Hobby Lobby rings. And we have, again, the odd cavitation in the different areas. So yes, the record is getting something. It can't get into the groove because we haven't changed the charge of the record, but it proves that, look, high energy, no energy, so these just do whatever surface cleaning. So then you, after your August article, that said, well, you know, maybe Charles is hokey with this. I have to buy this to prove to you that shoving this in between the records, the cavitation is very low because of the loading factor. OK? So here we're talking about skewers. And this is where we talk about, in a 6-liter tank, the loading factor is 1. 7 eighths inches between records, maximum 4. And then when I use the cavitation test with the, uh, with the uh, aluminum foil, even edge to uh, dead wax area, any record, any side. And then validated again for you, we put in the cavitation meter, 810 cabins between record 1 and 2, 800, 800 and, uh, sorry, 790 cabins between the edge of the tank and record one. This proves the cavit, and it's even, bottom to top, which corresponds again to the even cavitation of record edge to here. So now apply a spray, change the charge of the record, and you have something. Now these are pictures. Uh, this is a very famous machine, and you know this one. Uh, 40 kilohertz, uh, uh, zero dimpling, zero cavitation. Uh, this is at uh, Crescendo Audio, 120 kilohertz machine, uh, zero cavitation, zero on the meter. I can't say anything else. Bubbling, bubblers. Now that's something else. There are ultrasonics that use filters. Now you and I know both that some of the filters are 120 microns. This, this toy I had to buy for you at $178,000 measures the foam <laughs> that says it's between 180 and 300 microns. So. If I have that connected in any tank, it does nothing because what I'm removing is 3 to 5 microns. So the filtering process is also flawed. 
And if you're running the pump, which these guys do in their bubblers, as I call them, it negates cavitation. You cannot have moving water in an ultrasonic bath. You can't. So you cannot filter when an ultrasonic is running because you will negate the cavitation. Okay, so this is what we kind of talked about um, earlier that's very important. And, and forget about me selling anything, Michael. What everyone should do is do nothing to their records. If it's brown and fungus, distilled water, like you said, microfiber, get rid of it. Don't touch it with anything. Before play, use a 10 micron parastatic felt developed by Dr. Watts in the 70s. Removes the dust as the turntable uh, turns the record. And then use the carbon fiber to use to remove the static. You have a static prob a product, a problem. The ZO stat for 20, 30 years works fine. That's it. Don't do anything. Why removing the dust? Because the pressing oil, the release agent is still there. The heat of the needle with the dyne may bring in more dust into the record, creating more pops. But watch out these chemicals. In Mr. Fremer's seminar, uh, he was uh, is moderator of in RMAF, we have people that, um, there, is this safe for your record? Don't buy it if it doesn't have ingredients list on it. Okay, don't buy it. We don't know whether it's gonna do something to you, your hands. What happens if one of your grandkids drinks it? What do we do? I don't know. Well, you are very forceful and got this manufacturer to tell this recipe, right? Okay, because you're powerful. Well, what is it? Well, uh, from the chemical compatibility, or sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the catalog, which tells you what this chemical is, it's 12% toxic, it has ether, so I don't know what ether is. Go to the PVC chemical compatibility chart, go to the, the plasticizer compatibility chart, it's a no-no for plastic. It's being sold by a dental equipment manufacturer and it's used for jewelry and in the prisons made by the California Prisons Company to clean prison cells that are stainless steel and glass. Glass areas. That's not a record. So what we do, and this is where we kind of left off before, is in finally uh, kind of, uh, I, I, again, I don't like to sell what I do, but I do because that's why I'm here. We change the charge of the record. We use ultrasonics that are even, that are safe. We have the ultrasonic load factor of, one, of 810 cabins, even. And what we do is I change the charge of the record by applying a propendiol 1-2. It's propane, 2% in 98% in, uh, in of distilled water. And I have a colorant in there. So I apply it to the record, it goes in the machine, two or five minutes later, we tell you which times, out comes the record, I apply more of the ionizing agent, brush it in, and then the colorant shows me what the ultrasonic softened in the prior cycle. Put it back in the machine, another two or five minutes, take it back out, I'll see a rise. Ah, we're removing something, why? The record now is you know, being attracting the, the cavitation. Now, we have to do this step over and over because as the record spins in here, it loses its charge. So finally, when I see a rapid decrease of this uh, uh, white material in the colorant, it means it's the last rinse cycle in the machine, still with a, that spray now applied, that the record comes out virtually dry. And all of the uh, times that you put it, the record in the machine after the first couple of times, the water contains all of this gunk that you've removed from the record. So what is the consequence of that? Oh, wonderful. First of all, in, if you take a look at where the transducers are, it attracts that whole stainless steel basin attracts fungus. So you'll see the fungus on the bottom. But due to the triboelectric table of charges, a processed record, restored record, comes out virtually dry. There's nothing on there. But the water in, in the tank is still polluted. Doesn't with matter. It doesn't matter? doesn't matter because I'm only using that as a mechanical means to be able to now get the materials out of the record, but I take the record out. There's no film. It's dry. All the other processes need vacuum drying or air drying. Why? They've not removed anything. So How many records until you have to change the order? Well, I, being 
uh, being a nerd and understanding science, I change the distilled water every 10 records. Now, the records we see here are well cared because you, you don't have, they're not brown or gray. But what I do is every five records in the machine, I need to degas the ultrasonic. Degassing is important. What that is, is every time you put a record in an ultrasonic bath, it introduces air. And air is the enemy of creating bubbles in an ultrasonic by those transducers. So I remove the cover every five records. I take a look inside. Oh, it's not milky. Oh, that's fine. Oh, there's some fungus or whatever may be stuck on the bottom. I do the degas. So that's when I inspect whether really I want to change the water or not. And typically here at these shows, we have a variety of records. But I change the water out every 15 records, get rid of it, 89 cents. If you're going to do a lot of records, buy a distiller for $150 and create distilled water. But that's, again, it will not, as uh, just inferred, it will not coat your record. It's just the, the water is the medium of the action. I have a question. Very good. So this is our, our tank. It's a six-liter tank. The, the machine is made by Codison. It's not right. by, made by Isonic. Right. Isonic is a dental reseller. Right. Knows nothing about records. And I'm not going to reinvent an ultrasonic. I'm going to make it be better. So we selected the 35 kilohertz frequency for specific reasons. And here you see fungus that's being attracted to the bottom because there's a charge. This is the fungus that's come off the record. Okay, And it stays at the bottom. The water here is the water that is, as we just saw in your video, is the mechanism of being able to react with the record. But so yes, I need to degas it. It's fungus, but it's also all the gunk. Oh, there's all sorts of stuff yeah, in there. Yeah, there's yeah. fungus, there's gunk. Right. We see some plastic from uh, pressings that have been caught in the release agent, yeah. so that, that that's all fallen out. So in ultrasonics, what you do is you need to remove the air in order to Number one, improve the efficiency of cavitation. Right. Nobody else's machine has that that I know. Uh, of. Well, the the, the Codison machine has that. It does. Uh, and uh, the so-called degrader has a cavitation. That's, that's it right. has a decast, but I've yes. never seen it work. I've seen bubbles. Yeah. And you should not see bubbles. There you see bubbles. Here, this is air collapsing, imploding. This is what is the activity. But I'm just pulsing this to break as much of the air as possible right. inside. Uh, inside, we talked about just distilled water. I have uh, 1.4 ounces of 70% alcohol to kill that fungus that's live or dormant because I don't want to get sick. It's not a cleaning agent. So we're going to fictitiously say it's done. I'm going to put the cover. So this cover has specific, the, these, 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 uh, these, these angles and these lines in here aren't necessarily for stability. They're made to reflect the air back down. We'll and put and this you're, in. you're now making it for four full-size records. Uh, I have three full-size with the oh, yeah, uh, I, I, uh, with yeah, the yeah. Uh, upscale, and then I still have 45 because this motor is in the way. Right. Okay. And again, the spacing is important because I don't want standing waves. This one will clean a 10-inch LP. Yes. Yes. We did uh, records for KDKA's 100th anniversary transcripts, and they had uh, large ones. They had the 10 inches. So here's a record. And we can take a look here. Um, we have, uh, it's being priorly cleaned because we see some ring. resin rings ring here. Um, uh, here we have uh, gray. Gray is typically fungus. I'm going to take a look at the other side. Uh, fingerprints, uh, dirt, dust, fungus. So yeah. this is a well-worn record. So what we do. If this is too low, you can really bang up a record. <laughs> yes. So what we do is we put this in. So now what I'm doing is typically in the manual I say do five minutes because I don't know whether it's full of brown, crusty dust or whatever. Yeah. This one here, I'm just going to do two minutes because I don't see any major, major contaminants. It hasn't come from a flood. And uh, it's something that you have that, you know, has, has been protected somehow, okay? Now, I'm not really doing much because of the fact the record is repelling the effect of cavitation because the record's negative and the water in the tank is negative. So I'm just going to let this spin out. And so-called surfactants like the Turgiclean, tur that, that does not change the charge. No, it doesn't. It, no, it doesn't. That's just something. It's a soap. And it's, and it's designed to change the, um, 
Reduce the, uh, uh, surface, the, tension. the surface tension. And reducing the surface tension is not the same as changing the charge. Right? right, and it does not take advantage of the ultrasonic where now a droplet of water or cleaning agent is 100 microns on average, and a record groove is 30, 35 microns. So you're not doing anything by applying that with a brush on a horizontal surface. So uh, here, let's, uh, you know, you get to know the machine very well. Yep. So what I do is I wobble the record on top, not on the floor like I used to do in your house and your carpet. <laughs> I remove this so that I don't get the label that's wet. And then what I now do is I put the record onto the work area. I now take the, the goat hair brush and I crunch it like this because I want to apply a little pressure. So here, look here, I have not even applied a charge to the record and the ultrasonic has already done something to the surface because it has been severely coated with some cleaner in the past and we saw some residues. So this is the colorant here. It's, so this is good and this is just letting me know what the sonic softened in the prior cycle. So this is, uh, this out of sold as near mint. Just yeah. Oh, no, no. Well, it, it, in in the real world, it is. Near, it, you know, it looks like it's very. It looks like it's a very clean, quote unquote, record. Yeah, for its age, it's, uh, it's great. So here, what I do is I just uh, use the rabbit cloth just to remove the material on here, not because there's contamination. I want the record to talk to me. That's what I, I'm talking to the record, and it's talking to me. It says, Charles, I need another cycle. So here. There, look at this. This is what your needle was running on. It's schmutz. And we haven't even taken care of the cavitation effect yet because we didn't change the charge of the record. So I just move this around. Okay, and now here, we're going to put the, it in the, the machine. The skeptic in me would say, yeah. this, the skeptic would say, oh, yeah. the skeptic would say, what if you took a piece of black acrylic that's not a record, that has just a clean piece of black acrylic, and you sprayed some of that spray on it and did that, would it come up with white stuff? Uh, it, it will come if that acrylic was cleaned by a prior cleaning solution but, that we use for records, yes. But not yes. With it, clean with any, just a plain old new piece of acrylic? No. Shouldn't? Okay. No. Okay. This is a good no. question, right? Yeah, very good question. I think you've probably asked them every question you can That's up. why I went to law school, to get the, <laughs> the issues straightened out. Who, what, when, where, why? And that's why, again, as you know, I, I, again, Michael has been pushing my buttons to get the information, and I've been learning. You know, my my process. Of course, certain things I couldn't say because of patent protection, but I've always been honest in the result of what we do. And he's given me the challenge. Oh, I may not believe all of the things he says. Well, you know, the aluminum test. Ah, eh, well, but you know, I react to that, uh, and and I do it proactively, not because I'm asked because it's important for us in the audiophile community to be custodians of this. Yeah. Records are the longest serving media. You scratch an SACD or CD, it's gone. You lose your hard drive with all your downloads, it's gone. Music is still, so I hear a couple of clicks or pops or whatever. Can I improve on it? All the better. Then it's still there for decades and decades and yeah. decades. You've done the first cycle yep. with this, now you're going to do Yep, the first cycle. I'm going to wobble so this. So close to that. Yes, light. I know. I'm, I'm watching it. I'm watching it. I've done. Me. I've hit the light a couple of times with a red. I've been scolded, so I bring it here because the uh, it's not working with the frequency that I want. There's got damaged on the way here. So look here, here we are going to apply 12 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Again, the ionizing agent. Less. There's already less white material. Look yeah, at this. Not as foamy, but it's still. Okay, it's still there. Yeah. It's still there. Oh, yeah, but, now there's more. Yeah, yeah, but it's still there. Yeah. But it's not in the same quantity. So this means that I'm going to do another one you better. cycle. Okay? But we see the rise and then the fall. So the record is talking to me. And Say, it Charles. Matter if you don't hit every single square. doesn't because I'm changing the charge. Right. That's what counts. Yeah, and, and, the, and again, water is 100 microns in diameter, so that's a large area. Yeah. And when it comes to a groove, ah, more on this side. Here again, and now you hear that grunging sound. It's that's where the ultrasonic, the transducer, and the signal is being affected. It's now really working that record because we're attracting it. It will the grunging sound disappears as the record spins. It goes down because now the charge attracting the cavitation is going away. 
Okay. We'll let this spin. We've done the next. Yep. This is uh, now the. Uh, this this the was the uh, second second cycle of the uh, ionizing agent applied. I wobble this again. I'll bring it now. Notice something. The record is coming out dry. We had large sheets of water. Look at that. Now, small, small now just small bubbles of water. Look at that. Well, I wonder why. The triboelectric table of charges tells me that records repel water. So now. 12 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Where'd you get that little spinner you got there? Uh, I make it. Felt. Okay. I make it. It comes with our special. We had white material come out, but now, by the time I'm down here, it's evaporated. This is the last cycle, Michael. This is the last. Oh, plenty of white stuff. Yeah, but it evaporates. The, the quantity is now evaporating very quickly as I go. But from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, it's virtually gone. So this is the last cycle for this machine. Go around, do the dead wax area, and flip it over. Again, very few water droplets. So that's the other indicator of saying we're getting to the end of the process. Now, the test for you is when you play this record, if it leaves any kind of white gunk on your stylus. That's the test. Yeah, and that means that we did not remove enough materials right. out. But this confirms. A lot of people just say, oh, I'm going to put it in for three minutes and that's it, or three cycles. They, you need to talk to the record. So we have more information on our website where we did a shootout at uh, Domino Technologies with four audio journalists in Seoul in November. We now show you a record that was given for us to restore, and it's live. But we did it in sections, so it said cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four. But this is it. That's, this is done. Okay? Last cycle in the machine, and this will be five minutes. And uh, Setutsky's. So we have a few droplets of water. Okay. That's it. No air or vacuum drying. Use the Leica Optician's cloth used from the telescope manufacturing section and just do a polish. Yeah. And it, again, it dries really fast. It, yeah, it dries very fast. And, and also, again, the record is repelling the water. And the water droplets are larger than the groove. So I'm not getting anything in the groove by doing this. Yep. So then I'll do, I use the, we supply you a second one of these just for our machine and the other one to use always at your turntable. And I do a little windshield wiper action. So it's 10 microns going into a 6 by 30, 35 U-shaped groove per the RIA standard. Okay. Kind of sound good when this is done. There we go. And I do the other side here. I wash my microfiber cloths. Yes. I do that. With, with no soap. Yep, I do it with distilled water. Yep. That's it. Period. Okay, that's done. And then, again, the same thing. A little polish. So you don't spray the, the final thing of water anymore? No. I have not been doing that since the summer of 2019. I didn't know that. It says updates on our website available. I, I have no time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. And it shows that, you know, I don't pester Mr. Fremer all the time. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, I pester you all the yeah. time. Okay, so let's just take a look here. Again, using this light. Now, we've uncovered things that were hidden by the coating of the prior. And that's why I, there's a, these cleaning systems, especially record resellers, love to hide all this. That's why they put yeah. shoe polish, WD-40, um, lighter fluid to hide this. Look at that. I have, there's a scratch here. You won't hear that. There's a scratch here. You won't hear those. You won't hear any of those. There's a scratch here. There's scratches here. Like there, there's a group there. That we're yep, 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 here. Scratch here, scratch here. So we see that. Now, those nasty tone arm skids, and I've done it. I did it last yeah, week. Yeah. You know, I got distracted. Seven times out of ten, by doing record restoration, two things happen. Number one, that pressing oil did protect some of the surface scratches. Sometimes you see a lot of surface scratches on the record. Once we restore it, they're all gone because that film was there, especially for vintage records that have been like 40 years in a package. 
Some are never being opened. Those have that outgassing. So you have the plasticizer and all of this mix with the paper sleeve or the plastic sleeve and coat the record. So the scratches weren't on the PVC, on the record. Other times, yep, that nick is there. And seven times out of 10, as Mr. Riendo from Oracle, he was my first customer, my first show, he cried. He had a record that had a click and he's become a friend for, you know, since 2018. So now what we do is we bring this record over to your turntable. And what we do is, uh, and I don't want to disturb Mr. Mr. Uh, Boisclair. Mr. Boisclair, where we take a, the same agent, we take a dry brush that we keep. You keep always at your turntable station, and you do this, a little mist. This is dried, but I put a charge on this that now I let the record go. It's on the turntable, nice. and I move it across one way, the other way, and it applies a charge which will now repel dust so it will not affect your needle because it's repelling. How long will that charge last? That charge will last, well, I have not done any testing on it, yeah. uh, but um, I've never inspected it. I would assume that it dissipates after time depending yeah. on your environment. Yeah. And you can do that again. Yeah. Uh, and you do the second side, you do the same thing. Your record now is spinning, there we go, there, presto changeo, your record now is spinning, you do this again, then you either store the record or you play it. And always, even going from here to one room to another, you always use the clean parastatic 10 micron felt that Dr. Watts taught me about this in 71 when I was in at the audio shop on the, uh, and Bill Layton Audio in Montreal working the store in high school. And then you use the 2.5 million grounded carbon fiber brush for the static. Or is it that? Okay. All right. <laughs> Ready. Okay, so yes, so this, this, this seminar is on what, there are seven alignment targets that we need to attend to with our cartridge and our tone arm in order to get the most from the groove. I'm going to go into what those targets are, why they're important, why we even need to attend to them, and, uh, and just kind of give you a direction on how to do it. Not to talk about how to do it. That's why I've got all the videos on the website and so forth. Um, but first, let's get, let's get some general understanding out of the way. Let's make sure we understand how a record groove is cut let's and understand the scale of things that are in the groove and the stylus profile. So here's a, a great illustration I found on the, on the web on vinylrecorder.com of, of a, of a um, cutting cutter head. So this cutter head is just one of the two arms is actuating, and this is a right channel signal only. If you look at it from a bird's eye perspective, straight down on the record, you'll see that the left channel is not modulated, so that stylus will not, playback stylus will not move for that channel, but the right channel has this modulation that has been cut at a 45 degree angle to the surface of the lacquer. So obviously the left channel is gonna be just the opposite, and you can see it again in the bird's eye view there. Now, a mono signal, which is the same thing as, ha as the, the, Im the instrumental image between your two speakers, will be a horizontally modulated groove, okay? So when I say mono, just think of anything between the two speakers, because this happens in the stereo recording as well, obviously, frequently. And it's just left, right, left, right, left, right, okay? So the stereo is a combination of vertical modulation and horizontal modulation. It's going all over the place, okay? <clears throat> and now, um, uh, and, and it, by, looking at, by looking at a groove in a microscope, uh, that stereo groove, it's, it, it's impossible to tell what's in the groove, all right? Yeah. Now I want to get an idea of scale. So this is an <clears throat> image I took with my lab microscope. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to image the one of only one of the groove walls, <clears throat> and I wanted to view it orthogonally, that is 90 degrees to the surface of that groove wall. So I tilted my microscope 45 degrees, and I've got 3,700 times magnification here. To give you a sense of scale, one hair of your head would fill up the entire frame. This is how tiny this world is. So this is actually part of the Ortofon test records um, uh, uh, frequency sweep, the one that goes 
And this is a high frequency portion. It's around 10,000 hertz, this part of the signal. And this is the land of the record, or the surface of the record. And this is the bottom of the groove, OK? From, you see these peaks here, these undulations. Those are the mechanical, that's the mechanical manifestation of the sine wave. All right? and, and as the stylus goes over that, it deflects in sympathy with the perturbations in the groove. And I measure, so one full sine wave is from peak to peak. That's one full frequency, one full sine wave. So what's that distance? 11 microns. OK, so a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter, or a millionth of a meter. This is a tiny little world. If I were to, to, to look from this angle now, and I were to measure what is the height of that perturbation, how far up from the mean surface of the record does it go, the answer is less than three microns. Three microns. And this is a loud signal. If you've ever played these frequency sweeps, they're, they're pretty loud, right? This is how sensitive cartridges are to this tiny infinitesimal world of the groove. There have been a few studies done over the years asking the question, what is the smallest perturbation of the groove that we can resolve as a musical signal or audible signal? And the most conservative of them come down with the conclusion that the answer is in the low triple digit nanometer range. A nanometer is a millionth of a millimeter. Low triple digit nanometer. So, Let's put that in perspective. The wavelength of violet light, which is the shortest wavelength, is about 450 nanometers. So we're talking about perturbations in the groove we can hear that are smaller than even the most powerful optical microscope could ever resolve. Nobody can tell me this is not a high definition music source. No way. Right? Now the challenge becomes how do we how can we be able to read all of that information faithfully? That is the challenge, because it's a lot there, a lot there, and it's there for the gathering, and that's what engineering is all about. Right? So let's get uh, familiar with a stylus cantilever assembly. There are three manufacturers in the world of stylus cantilever assemblies for high-end cartridges. Namiki, which is now Orbre, or um, Geiger in Switzerland, or um, Ogura, Ogura, also in Japan. Um, now, at the end here, you can see the stylus mounted to the cantilever. And then here is a square coil bobbin or coil former. Now, these sometimes come in a cross form. This is a square. Either way, it's a convenient shape around which the manufacturer can wind wire or specify that it gets done by Namiki or Ogura. So the coil gets wound around that. Now behind that coil former is like a piano wire that's flexible. This is the pivot point. This is the, what, uh, what allows the stylus the cantilever assembly to even move about. Compliance? Uh, com well, the compliance is a function partly of that, but also of the damper. All right, I'll get to that. Okay. So then this pipe here is what's used to affix the whole assembly into the cartridge body. Okay. Now, the cartridge manufacturer, when they receive these from the manufacturer of the assemblies, will put a damper on this, which is a, a compliant material, usually donut shaped, that they slip over the end and goes behind the coil former. Sometimes they go in front of the coil former, sometimes both. But the point of that damper, and I will talk about that quite a bit, the point of that damper is to keep the stylus cantilever assembly in a mean position. So if it gets deflected, it will come back. It's deflected, it will come back. It's also meant, it's also meant to act as a mechanical damper, like a shock absorber. Because without it, it might go <laughs> right? All right. So uh, it has a few different functions. But the sensitivity of that damper is not well appreciated by audiophiles. I'll go into what that means. All right, lastly, a little anatomy on the stylus. OK, so I made this 1,000 to 1 scale model of a fine line contact stylus and a horizontally modulated groove that you're invited to play with after this. The, the major radius and the minor radius are the two parts of the stylus I want you to be aware of. The part of the stylus that actually contacts the groove is really, really close to the tip. And you'll notice near the tip that there is a curvature. That's the major radius. And different cartridge manufacturers specify different radii. radii. But that has an important function that major radius. Because 
these assemblies have to be built to within tolerances. We know that if this stuff, playback stylus were a flat edge, then the cost that we would bear for having the stylus misaligned on the azimuth axis like this would be very high cost indeed because we would have one edge of the playback stylus read the junction of the record land and the groove where there happens to be some, there's a lot of material called a horn that it would, it would not sound good, let's put it that way. So that radius exists so that the stylus can be misaligned, misaligned on the azimuth axis and still read the groove perfectly well. Okay? It, it's a very important, and I'll come back uh, to that point a little bit later. Then there's the minor radius, my favorite, and you'll see it right here. It's this real tight curvature. The point of having a minor radius that is between two and a half micro. Minor is front to back. The, um, minor, minor is, is. Yeah, front to back. Yeah, front to back, you are correct. Yeah. Yeah. The point of the minor radius is so that the playback stylus can mimic the shape of the, the, the cutting stylus. Did I say that right? The playback stylus can mimic the cutting stylus in its shape. And you'll, if, it, if it does not mimic it in its shape, like for example if we're a conical stylus, there are mechanical distortions that arise. These have been known for decades and are well documented. What's not well documented is fine line contact styluses, and if they become misaligned in the group, what are those distortions get thrown? That's the work that we're doing. So the cutting stylus on a cutting, uh, the cutting stylus has a cutting radius, an effective cutting radius of about two microns. So two and a half microns to four microns, we're pretty well there. Okay, that's that's wonderful. The other beautiful thing about these Japanese minor radiuses, because it's a ridge line that they've created, very complex shape. When they wear, they wear evenly. They don't change it. They don't change the contact profile. They just wear down at the same profile, and then one day it's gone, and then you got a, effectively a conical stylus. And but and now, uh, the Geiger style, the Geiger replicant styli, those are those are a wedge shape. They wear very quickly. That's the downside of those styli. But the upside is they can be aligned with much greater accuracy on the cantilever than these. All right? There's a cost for everything. Now, the seven alignment <coughs> targets. Here they are. There is one linear dimension that we need to hit. There are two forces we need to attend to. And there's four angles we need to attend to. Now, the linear dimension is it's a ge geometric function based upon the tone arm. How was the tone arm des designed? Its effective length and so forth. The two forces are determined by, that we ha have to manage, are determined by physics and cartridge construction. The VTF, the cartridge manufacturer, will determine the acceptable range. And the horizontal forces, I'm gonna go into those in a little bit. Now the four angles, how do we know what what angles, to, what angles to aim for as alignment targets. Those are determined at the lathe by the cutter head and the cutting stylus. That's where they are determined. Now, of these, of these seven alignment targets, five of them are di beyond dispute of what our aim should be. Two of them are that we have an acceptable range, and we'll go into that, okay? Overhang, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but it's effect effectively you, it's basically you want to get the distance from where the stylus touches the record to the pivot point to be at the proper position so that when you align the cantilever, you're doing so accurately. If your overhang is off, then your cantilever alignment will be by definition off. That's how it works. Won't go into that function, but you can please just take my word for it for now. The geometry is out there for you to work on. One, I want you to measure it at the height of the record. I own maybe four different types of these VTF scales. Every one of them I had to bend down the, the stylus platform because they're too high. Now, what's the cost of that? Well, many, many, many tone arms have a center of gravity that's higher or lower than the horizontal pivot of the tone arm. And when that condition exists, your v vertical tracking force will vary depending on the height at which you read that force. So if you've got these kind of scales, you can bend them down, make sure they don't touch the platter, but you measure it on the platter, not on the record, right? Second thing I'll mention about this is that please spend an extra 12 or $15 to buy a little set of calibration weights. 
um, and get a, aim for one that has a two gram weight from Amazon, um, and just to make sure that your, your scale is calibrated. Some of them as the battery weakens, they can get really wonky. Um, this is one I use frequently, but I've found the limits of this one as well. And it had nothing to do with the battery. So I always make sure that's calibrated, okay? Um, oh, uh, if you feel compelled to use the higher range or exceed the higher range of your cartridge manufacturer's recommended tracking force, you are most likely band-aiding a problem you need to fix first, okay? And that problem is usually mistracking, all right? So many people, when they hear that sibilance, the breakup, that happens most often in the inner area of the groove, right? But can happen anywhere. And happens often on vocal sibilances or um, you know, horn blats or whatnot. Much of the first reaction is increase VTF. Okay, so I get people, this is one of a common question. There's still chairs in here, fellas. There, I get common questions um, commonly, hey, I'm, it sounds flipping great, but I am occasionally getting uh, mistracking. So I run through these four steps for people in this order. One, confirm your VTF. And if you've got a calibration weight, please start there. Make sure you're measuring at the height of, of the record. Wet clean your stylus, why do I say that? I say my instructions are wet clean your stylus every three weeks or so. Not every time, not every time. There's risks with overwetting, um, most definitely. Um, and when you do, just be careful, you don't use a lot, of, a lot of liquid because the dust on top of the cantilever will be a wonderful source of capillary action to bring the liquid right up the cantilever and carry the dust with it. And you do that enough times and that dust has found a new highway to get right back into the cartridge uh, uh, motor area and eventually seize it up. So be very, um, very conservative with the amount of water, but you can just use distilled water, just do something. Why do I say that? Because occasionally I'll get a, a cartridge in for analysis where the, the client says, because I always ask the question, how do you clean your stylus? And occasionally when they say, I only dry clean, I occasionally see this transparent brownish gooey stuff around the, the, around the, can, around the stylus. And when that builds up, it can cause mistracking of its own. So I just want to make sure, let's eliminate that possibility. It's easy, it's cheap to do that some night. But most of the reason for mistracking is because the tone arm is out of control. Either the toner's got a high degree of stiction, that's static friction, meaning it doesn't want to move with the groove, or the horizontal forces are out of control. Too little or too much anti-skating, right? And that's what the Wally skater is for, to measure all of those things, stiction, and horizontal torque force, okay? And uh, there's a very interesting video, we'll go into a little, a little bit about that. So, repeat, repeat stiction again? Stiction is static friction. Okay. It's, it's, the, it's the force with which you must apply horizontally before you even get the tone arm to move along for the ride. So let's imagine, so you, you lower the stylus into the groove, the groove is a spiral, it's gonna carry the stylus, but the tone arm bearing has, let's say, high stiction. The, the stylus is moving, the cantilever is starting to skew, but the toner doesn't want to come along for the ride. Eventually, enough horizontal torque force will be applied, and then the, then the toner will come along for the ride. But it will do so always with a lot of torque force here. So a number of things are happening, not just early groove wear, and not just early stylus wear, but now you've misaligned the stylus, yeah. and worse, this is what I think is worse, the, the forces on the damper have been completely misapplied. It is, it is not asymmetrically damped. Um, so there's a lever action here, force here. Um, there's a generally a six to one relationship as a, as a function of lever force. So for every 0 0.1, 0 0.2 grams of force horizontally, multiply that by six to see what the force is on the compressed side of the damper. Now those dampers are there for a reason. <laughs> One is to keep keep the, the the coils in proper alignment with the magnetic flux field, and two to act as a mean remeasuring uh, repurposing function to get the, the the cantilever back into relaxed position. But if you're constantly keeping one side compressed, I guarantee you your performance is stuff suffering. So it's a similar thing like the skating force itself. That's right. And but it's a mechanically generated thing. 
where That's the other right. one is, is just de inertia. Basically. So, skidding force, when not compensated for, will cause the same issue. Yeah. And since skidding force is, on average, 10% of your VTF, mm -hmm. if you've got a two gram vertical tracking force, 0 0.2, that means 0 0.2 grams of anti skating, of, sorry, of skating force, multiply that by six, 1.2 grams of compression. That's 60% of your VTF that's applied to compress this damper heavily. No way that cartridge will function as well as it would have if you didn't have that force present. Yeah. All right? So the Wally Skater, my favorite tool, it, it, its purpose is to make sure that, that damper is able to do its function and that cartridge coil, that those coils are able to do its function. All right? It's easy to talk about how anti, setting anti-skating properly um, avoids uneven stylus wear. Yeah, but that's like third level importance to me. Second level importance is let's keep the stylus properly oriented in the groove, right? Third, highest level importance, let's keep that damper symmetrically compressed, okay? Uh, love this video. So this is a low to medium low compliance uh, cartridge and it's on a, at once a non-moving record and then moving record. It was on a 12 inch arm, which in retrospect was a mistake. I should have put it on a nine inch arm because the effect would have been even greater because shorter arms have more skating force, right? But what I wanted to see was what's the difference in the cantilever angle between when skating force is present and not present. And you can clearly see by watching the video how the cantilever angle shifts under those two conditions, right? So this is why anti-skating properly applied is so important. Anti-skating over applied will cause the same problem in the opposite direction. Now, yes, it is true that skating force changes as you transit a record. It actually starts high, it goes low, and then starts going high again. It is also true that since skating force is in part a function of friction, it changes with the musical content. Crescendo, you know, fortissimos, orchestral fortissimos, a lot more friction than little pianissimos. But that this function has been very, very well studied and documented over the decades. And we know that on average, 10% of your VTF is, is, uh, is there as, as skating force, all right? So let's aim for the mean, guys. You're gonna see me talking about that when we get to the angles. Let's aim for the mean. And that puts you in the best position to get the most results out of all of your records, okay? So what was that angle we just looked at? Now, this angle was a little more complex to do, but I wanted to simplify it in a single photo for you. 2.4 degrees, a little bit more. Again, if I had done this on a nine inch arm, it would have been even greater. Of course, that's on this cartridge. And different cartridges have different horizontal compliances and so forth, right? But that's significant. What's the 10% anti-skate uh, thing? The 10% anti-skate applied there, what's that? Um, oh, this, this is, this is with, with anti-skate applied okay. already. Yeah, okay. Um, it, but it wouldn't have mattered. If, even if I had, I would still see 2.4 degrees, okay? Because it's a function of friction being present or not present, right? So, you know, some tone arm designers say that anti-skating isn't important. I say, man. Yeah, I'm cleaning up after these advice, after this advice, right? <laughs> I'm happy to come in and say, you want to hear the difference? Which I did just down the hall earlier uh, yesterday. Um, this is the laws of physics. Uh, we can't escape them. I, <laughs> okay. And even, even on linear bearing tone arms, I, I won't name the name, but there is one very expensive uh, pivoted linear bearing tone arm, but I've also seen it on a true linear bearing. There's no such thing as pivoted linear bearing, I mean, pivoted tangential tracker, right? Um, that I wanted to, I, I put those on the Wally Skater first as well before I aligned the cartridge, because I want to know that that tone arm wire or any other function isn't pushing that assembly <coughs> one way or the other. And in one case, on a very expensive pivot uh, tangential tracker, I found that was actually the force that was being applied by the tone arm wire was off the, technically off the Wally Skater scales. It was no longer, once you get the Wally Skater gets to a certain point, it's no longer accurate. I don't care about that because I only care about anything like 12% or below. Is right? there more than one pivotal tangential tracker? Yeah, yeah, there are. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, but, and now the manufacturer knows about it. 
all right, and is doing something about it. Cool. Okay, um, but this is why we measure horizontal forces, mm -hmm. right? All right. So this, I love this. Okay, now we're going into the four angles. This is a cutting stylus. Uh, I'm also analyzing cutting styli. Just for purpose of perspective here, the part of this stylus that makes the groove is down here where my fingers are. That's it. That's the only part that makes that runs the groove. Because this is 50 microns across. The average unmodulated groove is about 50 microns across. All right. This one's also a little worn out. You can yeah. see it because a little white white flash right there. That's that's a worn out stylus. All right. Um, and so the four angles to attend to: azimuth, zenith, VTA, and rake. Okay, rake or SRA. Right. Now azimuth and zenith. It's it's there is no debate about what our goal is. Um, why? Because we know what they're trying to do in the, in the cutting room. In the cutting room on azimuth, they're aiming for 90 degrees to the locker surface. Now, could they get it at 87 or 91? Yeah, but they could equally likely get it wrong clockwise versus counterclockwise. So we aim for the mean, right? That way, most statistical likelihood of us being right on all our records, right? But we do this electrically. I'll go into that in a moment. We don't do it visually, like I mentioned before. Zenith, remember that's the function between, the zenith error is the function between that contact edge and the cantilever. We always assume that's a perpendicular relationship, but industry tolerance says plus minus five degrees. It doesn't keep me from seeing up to 17 and a half, by the way. Um, but we know, and the cutting lab, they are going to aim for that, that's the, if you draw a line from that side to that side, that way, they're gonna aim for it to be right on the radial line of the lacquer. If you draw a line from the center of the lacquer to the edge, that contact edge will be smacked out on it, not offset from it and not diagonal to it, okay? Those are the standards. That's what they aim for. That's what we should aim for, okay? Now, VTA. VTA is an angular relationship between the record and the cantilever. Now, they don't use cantilevers in, the, in a cutter head. It's called a torque tube or a torsion tube. But we know at what angles those are cut within a range. So if you've got a European cutter head, you've got, an ex you've got a, a, a playable range of between 23 and 18 degrees that you could change that torque to, to, to cut at. And if you've got an American cutter head, that range is between 20 and 15. So at the advent of stereo, the engineers got together and said, hey guys, we're no longer only modulating left and right. We're also now gonna start going vertically. And now that we're going vertically, the angle of our torque tubes is going to matter and you'll see in animation in a moment yeah. why that matters, right? So, hey, the area of commonality for us is 18 to 20 degrees, so can we all agree that we'll cut here? And it was never made into a standard that I'm aware of, but it's a general agreement, and I've spoken to um, uh, and spent time with a number of cutting engineers, Kevin Gray and, uh, and others, and I asked, what is your torque tube at? And I'm generally hearing 18 degrees, fine. Now, there is something called lacquer springback, which makes functional angle even less, but I'm not gonna get into those weeds right now, <laughs> okay? Let's just say, I'm saying almost always less than 22, and I confess, I'm taking liberties by saying that, it should really be less, but I'll tell you why I did that. There are very, very few cartridges that can get down to that angle, and there's two very bad reasons for that, and I'll go over that in a little bit. Very bad reasons for that. Um, but if I put 18, which is what I'd really rather put, it's gonna freak a lot, of audio, a lot of my clients out when they see the report, and I'll tell them this openly, all right? But it's gonna freak a lot of them out because they're gonna see that their VTA, the best I could do is 26 degrees or 25 degrees, right? But wait a minute, they, it's all the way down at 18? Um, what, what? And then some of them feel compelled to wanna go to the distributor or the manufacturer and say, you make a crappy product. Well, not so fast. Um, two things. One, VTA is the least sensitive to angular error, playback versus cutting, of all of these. And that's mostly because there isn't as much vertical content in the groove. Remember I told you that VTA is sensitive to vertical content, and I'll show you in animation why that's so. Most of the content is horizontal, all right, or 45 degrees. Right? But not so much vertical. And when you look at a microscope at a stereo group, you don't see as much of this, like hourglass shapes. So that would be vertical content, right? When you're looking straight down on the group, right? Rake. 
That's the really angular relationship between the record and this contact edge. Now, what's happening, again, what's happening in the, in the lab? Well, the lab is constrained by, uh, constrained by physics in, in one, one sense. We know that if they're going to take a swath of chip out of the lacquer, it gets sucked up by the, by the vacuum tube hose. If they're gonna take a swath out, if they cut at an acute angle like this, the likelihood of that sunny gelatinized uh, uh, swath getting hardened and smashed up onto the, onto the, uh, the, the cutting stylus and smashed down into the lacquer is very high. So there's a lot of risk by going to an acute angle. So most of the, Kevin Gray tells me he cuts at 90. There's um, two others who told me they cut at 90. Okay, okay, fine. And there's a risk with going too far as well. Um, and that's, uh, there's something called a vector force. And just think of a garden hoe through loose soil. As you pull a, gar a garden hose, you got an obtuse angle. So as you pull the garden hoe to towards you, what does the garden hoe want to do? It wants to dive. All right. So if you're cutting at an obtuse angle, then you're creating a vector force that's going to fight the cutter head. We don't want to fight the cutter head. Okay, so there's a physical limits. Whether the engineers are aware of these or not, I do not know. Right? Right? Um, so, and then, and then there is the, the study that was done in, 19, uh, I mean, in 1981 by Rich and Meyer. Not scientific at all. They didn't share with us their, their method in any detail to make it peer reviewable. And they didn't even specify it because they came up with an answer of aim for 92. They didn't specify whether that was dynamically measured or statically measured, okay? But it's the only thing we got so far, right? And between the physical limitations, what the engineers are telling me, and the best available information we got, I'm aiming for 92. But I tell you what, if I can get your VTA down a little bit, if your VTA is high and I can get it down another degree, then I'll go for 92, 91 or 90.5 SRA. SRA, while more sensitive to VTA to angular error, is still relatively insensitive mechanically to angular error compared to zenith or azimuth. All right, so it, it's still a sensitive, sensitive uh, 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 parameter. It, it's not as nearly as sensitive as those other two parameters. All right, so did I did I tell in this session about the audiophile inclination to raise or lower the, the tone arm and that they're hearing something? Did no, I mention yeah, that? Yeah, that was the last one. In this one, did I mention no, that? No. Right. You, you did at the, when I walked in, you were, you did okay. mention it. You want me to explain that? Yes, please. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so a lot of audiophiles, uh, they say, well, you know, I can raise and I got VTA on the fly, so I can hear a, a one millimeter change in, in tone arm height. I can hear that. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what you're hearing or not hearing. All right, but um, I have serious doubts whether you're hearing the change of SRA and VTA. Why? Because we've modeled up what SRA and VTA error look like in, in engineering software. And again, the mechanical error, error by a half a degree or one degree doesn't throw off big mechanical errors like Zenith error does, all right? I mean, it throws off some error, but it's, it's really, really tiny. So then what are these guys hearing? Well, when you raise and lower your arm, on most arms, the center of gravity of that arm is not coincident with the horizontal pivot, so you're changing your VTF. And that's most likely what they're hearing. On some tone arms, when you raise or lower the arm, you're changing azimuth, yeah, and that's a really sensitive one. But by angle. playing uh, one millimeter, there's not gonna be a huge impact on VTF. So. No, on a nine inch arm, one millimeter will be a, half, a quarter of a degree change. I'm not interested in change in chasing those kind of. Uh, I'm not interested in that level of, of granularity. I, I've not yielded anything from it, right? Um, and then the other thing that changes as you change tone arm angle relative to the playing surface is you change the vector forces at play in your arm. So I'm not going to tell you you didn't hear. I didn't. I'm not going to tell you you're making things up or you didn't actually hear anything. Though it would be fun to blind test these guys. Um, I'm just saying it's not SRA and VTA, not at one or two millimeters of change, no, okay? So azimuth. So the purpose of ana um, optimizing on the azimuth angle is to maximize your stereo separation. This is uh, something that has to be done electrically, and that means, unfortunately, using a test record. Mm -hmm. I despise test records. I've got a stack about nine inches high of all different test records, and I've analyzed them for their variation in what they tell me my azimuth angle should be and the results are not pretty at all, all right? 
um, from, from the, the difference in azimuth angle between the two tails of my distribution curve and my test was almost a degree and a half. Now, anybody here on a good stereo could hear a half a degree of azimuth change. One and a half degrees is like a different, different league. Right? That's completely out of it. But what, we're good, what we optimize for, remember, is not, it's not the stylus in the groove when maximizing stereo separation. It's, I'll show you what it is. So here is an is a animation I did of a, um, a cantilever assembly. And this one's got the cross formed um, coil form, okay? Now, it's modulating in a right channel signal only. So 45 degree, 45 degree, right? Now, what is that gonna do to these coil formers? Well, the right channel coil form is gonna move in the magnetic flux field and therefore, therefore throw off an electrical signal. The left channel is just spinning, that's all. So it conducts little to no signal whatsoever. That's a good situation to have. However, all of these assemblies are made with intolerance errors. And if you introduce a bit of shift to that coil relative to the 45 degree wall, what happens? Well, you get, you get what you get is this left channel, that red one now, is now moving just a little bit. That's crosstalk. But it's, it's now the left channel seeing a signal but only the right channel of the groove is being modulated. And that's a function of that misalignment of that coil former, which is why the only way to align azimuth is electrically, unfortunately. And because it's done electrically, it must be the last test we do, all right? Why? Because it's a multivariate test, meaning the answers you get from that test will be stained by any error on your other parameters. So fix those first before you do this. Otherwise, it will throw off your reading. So, right? so crosstalk is if you're reading the right channel, you're, you're listening to a little bit of the right channel on the left. That's correct. That is correct. Yes. Okay. All right. So, and this is the part where I, I tell people that I'm going to start showing you the statistics on how far cartridges are uh, are off from perfect on average in my data set of all my analyzed cartridges. Don't be disparaged, please. The point I want to make is, if we can enjoy vinyl as long as we have, as much as we do, and be misaligned, which is most of us, then just think how much more we have to look forward to if we optimize our angles, our forces, and our dimension, okay? And of course, there's things to get better in, in the lab as well, in the cutting, in the cutting room. But look, it's a very forgiving medium. It'll make beautiful music, a conical style, so make beautiful music, even though there's tons of mechanical distortion, right? So a little bit hair under one degree is the average azimuth error. Again, I'm confident everybody here could hear, everybody here could perceive a half a degree of difference on a, on a resolving system. And a quarter of a degree is easily measurable, okay? Now, rake angle. This picture was taken with the Wally scope. Um, and of course, rake angle is the angular relationship between the record, and the contact edge, right? Um, I, I shouldn't have written 92.5, the ideal is 92. Uh, I say that with some hesitation and concern because it can't be truly substantiated. So I'm really happy with a range between 90.5 and 92.5, I'm happy with that. But if I need to get down, get that VTA down in order, and, and get to the lower end of that range, fine, I'm fine with that. Right, but SRA, uh, oh, let me give uh, first a mechanical idea of what happens wrong mechanically when the playback rake is different from the cutting rake. So you remember that image I showed earlier of the high magnification uh, test track with the undulations running, running horizontally up the screen. Now put that 90 degrees to the side and just imagine that each one of these lines is, is the peak of the curve. Now the, the contact edge is at a significant rake angle difference compared to these peaks. So, and this is exaggerated view, what will happen is that this stylus edge will skip from peak to peak. It won't reach all the way into the undulations, okay? Again, an exaggerated view for purposes of understanding what's the mechanical error at play, all right? Here's the average error, 3.11 degrees uh, on the whole entire data set of a few hundred cartridges analyzed, with 92 being the target. Um, now, I don't know of any tone arms that will do a full three degrees. On a nine inch tone arm, 
that's uh, a little more than half an inch, half of an inch, okay? From center, so from level, half inch down. Not many of them will do that. And even if they could, I wouldn't want the arm to operate at such a suboptimal um, angle. Again, vector forces at plane air will be different. This is why when I, when, I, when I analyze the cartridges, so many of my clients will be using the corrective shim that I make for them, okay? 16 degrees has been the worst I've seen, all right? And there is no relationship to the price you pay for a cartridge and the accuracy with which these styli and cantilever have been mounted. None. I've seen, uh, <laughs> it makes me angry what I see, yeah. so I see, okay? Oh my gosh. Um, vertical tracking on. So this is, this, is, uh, this is kind of fun for me, I like this. Remember, I, I'm, I'm saying this with some hesitation. I say less than 22, and I say less than 22 again because I don't want to exacerbate the natural tendency of the audiophile to trigger their, have their OCD triggered and say, why am I so far away from 18, JR, where you really want me, All right? There, I told you, I think I mentioned there are two reasons why the cartridge manufacturing industry isn't getting down to optimal playback angles, and I'm gonna go into that, okay? Um, so, but first, an illustration, an animation to show you what's the mechanical cost of being wrong. So this is a representation of a vertically modulated groove. Again, remember, not too much of this in the stereo signal, but it's there, right? And if you notice, and this, this VTA is pretty steep, what, notice what's happening with the velocity of this stylus as it transits up the undulation and then down the undulation. The velocity is very different. It's slow going up, it's fast coming down. Now cartridges are velocity sensitive instruments. The higher the velocity, the louder the amplitude. All right, so this would make for an interesting waveform. If the VTA angle was less, you wouldn't that happen. Ah, you bring this down and the Even velocity down. evens yeah. out. Yeah. That is absolutely correct, yes. So, so this is the cost and the result of this electrically are forms of distortion, intermodulation and, and harmonic. Again, this is the least sensitive to being wrong, audibly for us. Uh, in principally because there's not as much vertical content in the group, all right? Um, Here's, now this is artificially low. I forgot to make one adjustment factor. We need to raise this number by 1.3 degrees. Uh, I forgot to adjust for something. So it's actually closer to seven degrees away from ideal. JR's ideal, 22, but it should really be less than that. Again, I'm not even gonna go into lack or spring back. There, there could be benefit to getting down to 10 degrees is what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> All right, there's the highest VTA I've seen. Now there are two horrible reasons why Vertical tracking angles are what they are. They're not good reasons. And the first one is because of peer pressure, principally from the German audience, because apparently, and oh, by the way, I was told this by a very, an excellent cartridge manufacturer. Um, had some very nice discussions with them. And this was their perspective, and it makes a lot of sense. So the Germans in particular are really, uh, really focused on that the, the, their cartridge be able to navigate the most torturous portions of a test track on apparently what is very popular, the Ortofon test record. But it doesn't matter, it could be any test record. And they're very adamant that if it's a good cartridge, it will track at the 80 micron or 90 micron, whatever, uh, test tracks. Now, no responsible engineer is gonna cut at these amplitudes. They're crazy. They're really out there. But whatever reason, audiophiles, the audiophile press has has used this as a, used the test record tests tracks as a measure for how good a cartridge is. Never mind, I already went into the fact that the most likely cause of mistracking is the tone arm, not the cartridge. The horizontal torque forces are out of control, okay? Plus, remember, misalignment makes mistracking easier to happen. So this is a situation that there's been a lot of pressure against the cartridge, uh, for the cartridge building industry to make their cartridges track better, even when there's poor hygiene for the tone arm, <laughs> okay? And, and so what's one way to make a cartridge track more powerfully? You take that angle of the cantilever and you raise it. You've changed the vector forces now. And I like to think in extremes in order to understand a principle. Now just imagine a, a, imagine a, a cantilever at 90 degrees. 
Okay, it's not gonna happen in a stereo. But just imagine for a, man, a moment. As we're modulating, how difficult it with, with such an extreme angle, how difficult it would be now that we've created a, a situation that, that whereby it would be very difficult for the groove content to throw the uh, stylus off of one of its walls. We've created a, a vector force that's real powerful aiming downward. So you, th their, their solution has just been lift up that, lift up that ca uh, cantilever. It makes it easier to trap, even when your tone arm's out of control. The second reason is also, I say, a bad reason. One way to be able to have more flexibility in cartridge design and to be able to increase output of your uh, of your cartridge is to put um, the magnet one of the magnet structures called the front yoke in front of the coil former, not just behind the coil former. But in order to do that, you have to drill a hole through it. Um, many of you have cartridges like this. There's a hole through which the cantilever comes out of. Well, that hole was made in what, what um, the front yoke. That's a, that's been magnetized. By being able to have that yoke there, you're increasing the magnetic power of the magnetic flux field, which increases the output of the cartridge, okay? But there's a cost. Because you've created some material underneath the cantilever, you now have to offer clearance between that material, that the bottom of that yoke, and the record. So that limits your ability to get much material on there and get your cantilever angle down. So how do they make the situation better for themselves to be able to make a higher output cartridge and get more material underneath the cantilever. Well, they raise the cantilever angle. Makes it easier to build a cartridge, all right? So, but at what cost? Much of what we experience as audiophiles when we hear our improvements are, wow, I was living without that all this time. I thought I was satisfied, but I never want to let this go. I mean, we don't know what we're missing until we get it, right? So, and this is one case where something has been accreted from us slowly over time, right? That it'd be nice to get back, right? Last, last uh, angle, zenith error. So taking an image like this was incredibly difficult. It took a long time for me. Um, I was inspired actually by Charles to get a really high-end microscope. Mine's not as good as his, um, but it has the functionality I need to take photographs like this. Being able to illuminate that contact edge, because that's the part that touches the stylus, I mean, the, the groove. Being able to illuminate it was really difficult. All right, and then worse, being able to measure what's the angular relationship between that and the center line of the cantilever. Now, this is what's called a stacked image. It's, it's like 200 photos taken in succession because as you get down the stylus, it's further and further away. Uh, I, gotta, I gotta take a picture of this. Snap, 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 snap. And then it, the software puts it all together in a composite image. I don't take my measurements from this because there is always some error in that process. I use a different process, but I like to include a photograph like this for my clients so they can kind of get an idea of what we're working with, right? Um, so the target, as we know, is collinear with the radial line of the record. Now what's the cost, mechanically, of being wrong on the zenith? So here is a, a, a groove that's been, it's a horizontally modulated groove, and we're looking straight down the groove. And then here is a representation of a contact stylus. Same thing over here, except this one's properly oriented in the groove, and this one's got a zenith error. Now, watch how they behave differently. This one's left, right, left, right. You can see this, this spring is very helpful. It's left, right, left, right. This one's going in an ovular pattern. It, because of the zenith misalignment, it has induced a vertical excursion for the entire stylus and cantilever and cartridge motor, right? So this is why, and this induced vertical motion is why misalignment makes mistracking more likely. It doesn't make it happen, it just makes it more likely, right? Because it creates a vertical vector force, a vertical vector, right? So this is the cost, and this is very audible, as Michael shared earlier before. So here's the average zenith error in the field of my few hundred, uh, uh, few hundred cartridges. That doesn't keep me from seeing 17 and a half degrees. That was a $4,000 cartridge. I've seen a $16,000 cartridge that's more than 10 degrees. I've seen a few $10,000 cartridges that more than 10 degrees. I see this pretty regularly. This can be fixed, right? This can be adjusted for as long as it's not too great. Well, look, 17 and a half degrees, that's going back to the factory. 
right? There's no two ways about that, right? Um, but this is gonna be, that's what the Wally Zenith is about, right? And there's actually a way to use the Wally Zenith and use your ears to find the best. It's tedious, it's tedious, but it's doable. I'm working on a tool to measure this in the field because I think it's unacceptable that in order to know this parameter, you have to right now send it to me in the lab. But I know for a fact that country manufacturers are not measuring this parameter. Remember, they can get plus minus five degrees best with intolerance. And they aren't because they're, they're telling me they don't. And I can see that they aren't. Either that or they're really callous about what we get. But they're telling me they don't measure for it. It's, it was very difficult for me to do that measurement. It was very expensive too, right? Now, Soundsmith and Ortofon, because they use a Geiger replicant, um, um, a replicant stylus is much easier to image Zenith error than the Japanese varieties. But of course the cost with the replicant is that it wears fast as, as opposed to the, the, the Japanese um, pro profiles. Um, so the, the worst I've ever seen a Geiger replicant off was three and a quarter degrees. That's the worst I've ever seen. All right, And compared to the rest of the field, that's, that's, that's pretty darn good. Now, just because a cartridge manufacturer cartridge manufacturer tends to make better aligned stylus cantilever assemblies isn't in and of itself the reason to buy them because you have to like, I mean, there's many more things that go into making how a cartridge sounds, not just that, all right? So it's the second most sensitive to alignment after azimuth. So questions? Yes? I wonder if a profit center would be for some company to start up that would provide this service either to the manufacturers so that they could do some uh, you know quality uh, monitoring on the, the uh, production process or to the customers uh, you know the aftermarket or this would just be a very common thing to have it vetted either before or after purchase so that yeah. these adjustments can be made <laughs> well that's what, you, that's that's what, what i do right